Okay, hello everybody. We are going to go ahead and get started. This is the June 2019 HMIS user meeting. Um, if you haven't already, please enter your agency name into the chat so we know who is participating. And we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so we're going to give you an update on the system performance report as well as a, a demo of the history tab in HMIS. Um, we're going to go over um, some updates to the reports page on our website. And then um, we have a couple more um, demos on approximate date started and the contact tab. We're going to update you on some available knowledge base articles. And then finally go over the um, COC funding grant consolidation as well as quickly update you on the transitional housing performance reports. And if there's any um, burning questions that you have or, or anything you want to see in HMIS, we can do that at the end during the QA session. Okay, so first up, um, for the system performance report, it was submitted to HUD um, at the end of last week. Um, so thank you so much for to everyone that was able to make those revisions in HMIS. It really does help um, improve our data and make sure we're submitting the best data that we can. Um, just as a reminder, the reporting period for that report was 10 to 9 18 And um, this report is data for all projects in HMIS, so it's reported to HUD at the COC aggregate level. Um, and they use it to um, assess how we're doing as a COC on our performance and whether or not we're improving. And um, when we submit our COC application to receive federal funding every year, these, um, this report is included as part of it. Um, so it's really critical that the data is right. So thank you for your help on that. Um, so the report is published and available on our website, and we'll also include these links in the meeting minutes when we send it out. Um, the full report, so this is exactly what is submitted to HUD. Um, I'm not going to go through everything right now, but you are welcome to review the entire thing. Um, it includes all the measures, and the last page also has uh, a, a brief data quality section. That, um, and right now the focus of this section is the missing destination values, which is what HUD chose to focus on. Um, and I am happy to see that year over year we are slowly improving in, in really all project types. So good job also on that, everyone. Um, and we also do oh, do have um, go a comparison um, document that kind of gives you a little more context and detail. So this document was created by um, 210C and it is comparing the data that we submitted on the system performance report for 2016-2017 um, to the data that we just submitted in 2017 to 2018. And um, this isn't every single thing that's on the system performance report, but it's uh, really the highlights. And um, we, we included a brief description of what the measure is as well as an explanation on why um, the, the change that you're seeing occurred. Um, and you'll see these red and green arrows. The, the green arrows means that um, it was a positive change and the red means that it was not. Um, so we want as many green arrows on this document as possible. Um, but kind of the theme that you'll see in, in our explanations throughout the document is that um, a lot of the changes were due to um, additional agencies and projects that started participating in HMIS over the course of the past year. Um, that caused a definite increase in the number of clients included, which you'll be able to see in all of these measures. Um, and it also makes our data more accurate because we have a more complete picture of um, what's happening in our COC. Um, and the other thing that you'll see is that there have been some areas that we have focused on as a COC over the past year 
in terms of um, data quality and accuracy. Um, so that's another reason a lot of these measures changed the way they did. Um, so like I said, both of these documents are they're posted on our website now um, and we'll also include them in the meeting minutes. So um, if you'd like to review in more detail, you are welcome to. I'm going to pause briefly and see if any questions have come in on this. I'm not seeing any right now, so I'm going to um, move on, but if you think of anything, let us know and we can definitely come back to it. Um, all right, so next up is the history tab, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I can't find you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. There you go. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, as you'll see later, we uh, published an article this month as an overview on the history tab in HMIS. So, we're also just going to do a demo to show you different ways that you can use the history tab. Um, Basically, the history tab is useful for looking at a client's um, service history, both their services and program enrollments, um, assessments, and referrals. So this tab can be used to figure out, you know, what's, what the client has already received and maybe didn't work for them. Um, you can look back to see where they've been served before and possibly coordinate with um, prior service providers. So I'm in the training site. This is a fake client. And I'm going to go to the history tab. So the history tab shows a, all of a client's enrollments, services, referrals, and assessments. Um, so down at the bottom, there's a very light and kind of hard to see um, color code legend down here. So services are in white. I'm sorry, enrollments are in white, services are in yellow, referrals are blue and assessments are in green. So if you can keep those straight, you can kind of keep that in mind as you're scrolling through um, as you're scrolling through a client's history tab. If a client has a long history tab, like this client does, goes on for two pages, um, there is a pretty robust search option that you can use. So to get to the search option, you click this drop down menu. Um, you can filter by any of these service categories, any agency that the client has been served at. You can look at a specific period of time, or you can filter by the type of information you want to look for. So if we click on programs and click search, you're going to see the same information that you would get by clicking on the programs tab. So if we look at services, We can see that this client has received many services. Um, maybe we're planning on working with this client um, around employment. So we want to see what this client has had before. And we can see that this client has had a number of employment-based services. So maybe that's an area to focus on. And then you can clear this out and go all the way back. Um, the right sidebar is the same as you see on the profile page and the programs page. So it shows any active members in the household that the client might have active services that they have programs where they're active and your clients will probably not have quite this many programs. And then you can also see the most recent services that they've received and the staff members who have worked with them before. All right, so if we look here at this last column that's not labeled, there are a number of icons that can be attached to items on the history page. So this first one that looks like a comment box is going to be a copy of a note that was attached to whatever the item is. In this case, it's a service and there's a note about the case management meeting that this client had. Down here, there's a dollar sign icon. And this will show up if 
a client received a service that had a dollar amount attached to it. And there's also a link icon. So this will be attached mostly to um, program enrollments that are the result of a referral. So if you see a yellow item that has a link, you can hover over it and you can see where the client was referred to that enrollment from. Okay. I think that's it for an overview. Are there any questions? Um, I'm not seeing any questions, but I did want to um, remind everybody that um, this page can also be used to um, potentially help you locate your clients. So if you are a street outreach team or an access point um, who did a VI spit out with a client and you're having trouble locating them, you can definitely search for that client in HMIS and come to this page um, and look at the, the programs to see if um, the client is currently being served by another program, and then you can contact uh, that program to get in touch with your client. Um, that's just, and that in case some of you haven't maybe thought of that before as an option, you can definitely do that here. Um, or you can also go to the programs page like Casey is on now and see where they may be. Um, there's way too many active programs for this client, so uh, you should not see this many on a real client, but um, any of them that are active, that would be a way to try and reach out to your client if you're having trouble um, getting in contact with them. Um, I do see a question now. How do we add the service icons to the client? Um, you don't necessarily add icons to anything. The icons automatically populate based on whatever the item you've added is. So for services like this case management service where there was, um, there was a note section down here, um, it automatically populated this little icon that you can hover over and read the, um, you can read the note. Was that what you were and asking, Christine? And, and it's the same for the, um, the, the money icon right. one. Yeah. It shows up um, if the service type is a financial, some kind of financial service. Um, Notes in the service comment box will be available for everyone to view. Will case notes be public as well? So notes that are made on this tab are not viewable unless you're logged in as that agency. Public alerts are, but notes here are not. All right. looks like uh, questions have slowed down, so uh, we can keep going. Okay. So now we're gonna go over um, just a change to the reports page. Let me go back to the front page first of our website. So if you already know which report you're looking for, you can come hover over the um, report drop down here and click on any of these links to be taken to the page for that report. So this is a system performance reports page. Um, if you don't quite know what you're looking for, you can click where it says reports and be taken to our new reports overview page. So we created these categories of information, um, such as COC level data. So reports that have COC level data will show data that is pulled from the entire COC as opposed to project level data, which is information that is drilled down to an individual agency or project level. So if you know you're looking for a specific type of data but don't necessarily know where to find it, um, you can come down to this little chart. And if you're looking for data quality, for example, you can look at the reports that have the check marks in that column. And these just link to the pages for that report. Um, Aaron, are there any questions? Uh, no, I'm not seeing any. Okay. 
Oh, wait. Hold on. Um, can agency administrators run a report for project data quality? I see in my dashboard there are clients with data as unknown that I would like to correct. Um, so yeah, there are <laughs> there are a number of reports that can be used to look at data quality. Um, and I think if you click on the number in the dashboard, it should show the identifier numbers that it applies to you, is that correct, Erin? Um, I believe so, yes. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think the report that you would want to, want to run, Christine, is the program details report. So that's this one, um, GNRL 220. So depending on whatever data element you are looking at, you can run that report um, and it should show up since it's on the dashboard. If you aren't sure, you can always submit a ticket and we can pinpoint a more appropriate report for you. And Carmen, um, any plans to have descriptions for individual reports? So we do have um, we have a reporting webinar that we made when we first um, came to Clarity that goes over the main kind of canned reports that you might want to use. And I don't know if the descriptions are copied in this article or not. So there aren't descriptions in this report, but if you watch the um, video or look at the PowerPoint slides, this might be what you're looking for. Um, there are descriptions and instructions for running each of these reports, and if none of these reports fit your needs, you can submit a ticket and we can point you to the correct report for whatever you're looking for. And for the, um, the reports on our reports page, um, I suppose we could add a description to this chart, um, but we also, if you click on any of these reports on that page, it does include a description there of what that report is. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions right now. All right, so Elizabeth, do you want to share your screen? Okay, Elizabeth? Hi, everybody. Yes, hello. Okay. So today I want to take some time to review the approximate date started field which is a field that you encounter on the enrollment screen when first enrolling clients who are heads of households or adults. So the approximate date started field should represent the start date of the client's most recent experience of homelessness. However, when 211 performed data quality monitoring on HMIS data, we found many filler dates in this field, such as 1-1-1900, um, which seemed to have just been entered to ensure a non-blank field, and many suspiciously early approximate date started values, such as 1-1-1980. So since this field is used to calculate performance metrics, it's very important that we have accurate data for this field in HMIS. Approximate, approximations for this field are acceptable. So you may not know the exact date, but um, you can use an approximate date. However, you should never enter filler values. And very early approximate date started values may also be incorrect. Since this field represents the most recent date and would start over if a client has a break in homelessness, 
So according to HUD, a client has a break if they spend seven or more days in a permanent housing or transitional housing situation, or 90 or more days in an institutional situation. Um, because of this start over aspect of the approximate date started field, a, a very early approximate date started date um, may be incorrect. So, how can you determine a more accurate approximate approximation for approximate date started? A HUD provides this guidance. So you would have your client look back at the date of the last time that they had a place to sleep that was not the streets, an emergency shelter, or a safe haven. And uh, the date a client's homeless situation began may precede a period of moving back and forth between streets emergency shelters or safe havens. So maybe they moved between these different places that are considered literally homeless situations. Um, and as long as it's continuous, then the first time they became homeless would be their approximate date started date. However, if they have breaks in between this continuous movement between these literally homeless situations, the approximate date started should be after those breaks. Um, you can also help your client by looking at the history tab within HMIS to see if there are any um, records of permanent housing or transitional housing breaks. So again, that's if the client was in a permanent housing or transitional housing situation for seven or more days. So I wanted to show an example of how this might look. So it, I have two cases here on the top and the bottom. So in both of these cases, the client first experienced homelessness on the 1st of January in 1980. And in the top case, the client has a break in 1995 until the 1st of January in 2019. And then they experienced homelessness again. So let's say this was an institutional break. Since the client was in the institution for more than 90 days, this counts as a break. Therefore, when you're entering their approximate date started date, um, when you're entering them in your project, you're not going to be entering 11980. You will enter 11-2019, so the date after the break. In the second case, the client was an in institution from the 1st of uh, November until the 1st, in 2018, until the 1st of January 2019. So if they were in the institution during this period, it's only 61 days which is um, less than what constitutes a break according to HUD. So since they did not have a break, the start date for the continuous period of experiencing homelessness is 1-1-1980. So for the top case, you would have approximate date started 1-1-2019, and in the second case, you would have approximate date started 1-1-1980. So this is an, ex an easy example since there's only one break, um, but there may be many breaks. I hope that this just portrays that whenever there is a break, uh, the approximate date started should start over. And we hope this review will aid you when you come across this field again on the enrollment screen or having trouble collecting an accurate value. Um, okay, so let's see, we had a question. This data is rarely completed on the CE documentation when clients are refused are referred to OCHA making it difficult for us to know what to put in this field once we are determining their PSH eligibility. Um, I can bring that up to um, uh, Rebecca. So she's overseeing coordinated entry um, for the county now. Um, I can bring that up to her and, and have her work with the street outreach teams that are doing the initial data collection. Um, if if you do if you are able to um, talk to the client yourself, then um, you would ask them of the approximate date their homelessness started um, as of the point that the intake was originally completed. I know that doesn't you don't always get a chance to work with the client directly, but um, they that's when you would um, calculate their approximate date started. Uh, okay. Okay, I'll stop sharing my screen now. Okay. Um, 
Myra, do you want to share your screen? Let me. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so hello everyone, as you may have noticed, the contact fields are now gone um, from the enrollment screen. I believe we did put them there temporarily, but everyone should be now using the contact tab for any new um, contact information. And we'll get into what that means in a little bit. So for now, I wanted to do a brief demonstration. I know we did one last month, but uh, we wanted to go more in depth as to what that would look like. So let me just do a couple things on here and let me know if you have any questions. So to start, um, you want to click this Add Contact tab uh, to add a new contact for a client, uh, assuming that this is a new client and you're adding this information. So we now have these three options to label um, what type of contact it is. So for example, if it's a case manager, an emergency contact, or the client's contact um, themselves, you want to select which one it is and then just add whatever you may have for them. So you wanted to uh, make sure you label it as being an active contact if you're sure that this is a current information as well. Um, you do have the option to make it private. So in case the client doesn't want to share their contact information with outside um, agencies, you would be able to switch that off so only people within your own agency can see that. And adding a contact date will also help to determine when, uh, how accurate that information is. So you can just add today's date and perhaps a note. So for example, um, voice message for the voice box is full. So what that would look like once you save the changes is would appear like this. It'll have the contact type, um, what the phone number is, email, when it was that you uh, created it. A little lock will appear here if you hit private and then the note as well will appear. So um, one thing to note is that you do have the option to edit, so for updating it or deleting the contact. What we would prefer you do um, is that you do not delete this contact. So for example, say this client got a new, um, a new phone number. So instead of deleting this contact, um, you would just update that information right here. So whatever that may be. Just go ahead and make sure you put active again, and then just go ahead and hit save, and then that's gonna update that information here. And the reason for that is that, for example, if this client no longer has access to this uh, phone number, say that they uh, missed a month of phone payment bills, that number is no longer working, but say the next month they're able to pay their phone bill and they have access to that line again, if you delete it, that's gonna delete it from view entirely. So you won't be able to see it at all. Um, so then that contact information is lost uh, permanently versus just making it inactive for the time being. Let's see, for example. Yeah, to put in the contact date. Yeah. So say for example that I didn't hit that toggle for that uh, active switch, it's gonna show as inactive contacts. You can still view it, it will just be hidden from you and whoever looks at this page will see that it's an inactive contact. Um, of course, if this is a number that is no longer connected to them, so say for example, that number gets reassigned to somebody because I know they recycle phone numbers at times, then maybe that would be a good idea to go ahead and delete it just because you know for a fact that's no longer that client's contact and we don't want to bombard whoever's contact that is now. Um, but unless you're certain, just switch it to inactive. So that way in case, um, they do receive contact to this phone number or email once more, you would be able to at least see it and update it from there. Um, let's see, is there anything else? Yeah, so we do have a knowledge base article available for this now. Um, so I would stop sharing my screen, screen now. But we do have a knowledge base article available now that reviews uh, how to do each and every step as well. So you can refer back to that. And can we pull up the slides again? Yes, maybe. Uh, 
Oh, and then one thing to know, um, BitFocus will be finishing up the migration for the old contacts over to the new contact tab in about a week. Um, so until then, the old contacts are on the enrollment as view only. So if you do have a new client um, information to add, go ahead and put that in the new contacts tab um, as all the other old contact information will be added over there within a week, hopefully. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, so um, go ahead to the next item. Okay, so we do, we have been working on a couple knowledge base articles, so we uh, thought we would highlight some of them on here. As Casey, uh, Cassie just went over the history tab overview, we do have the knowledge base article linked here, as well as the contact tab information one. Um, we also have one on how to add services, um, the annual assessment due reports, how to create notes and public alerts, status and annual assessments, running HMIS CAN reports, um, agency and project setup, as well as the COC grant consolidation, which I'll get into right now. So last year during the fiscal year 18 NOFA for the COC funded projects, multiple agencies chose to consolidate their COC con uh, contracts. So we wrote an article that details how the consolidation process was done, how uh, funds were being drawn or should, should be drawn, and the expectations for the APR reporting for the consolidated grants. Um, so we will get into that right now. So HUD combined some grants using uh, certain parameters so for example, projects had to be the same project type, meaning that PSH projects would not be able to be combined with a rapid rehousing project grants. The number of beds and units for all projects were combined or so added together. And HUD used a formula to determine the type of uh, the term for the new consolidated grant if the operating years uh, were not the same. So that, that way they could still be drawing um, funds from that. So in this example, assume that all of these grants uh, wanted to be consolidated. The one in blue uh, was determined to be the surviving grant and the project, uh, the target project for the new consolidation. Uh, so that's why it's highlighted in blue. Um, that's just kind of give you a visual as to what that would look like as far as you know grant type, the different operating numbers, the bed and units that were um, in those three grants are not gonna be combined into one. For our own COC, you'd be able to identify the surviving grant by looking at the four numbers following the CA on the grant number identifier. So in this example, it has XX and then 0180. Um, for our continuum, it would be CA0180. So the ID would be 0180. So you can move on to the next slide. Um, so as I mentioned previously, HUD made sure to add uh, the different operate to keep in mind the different operating years for the consolidated grants. So what that means is that the APRs would be so that one APR would be required for each expiring fiscal year 17 grant that was grouped together. Expiring fiscal year 17 grants are to report on their full operating year for their APR since they were drawing funds through the end of the operating year. Um, with that being said, there are a few things that agencies with these consolidated grants must keep in mind. Um, agencies are to continue to report all activity on active and new clients in HMIS in the project where their expiring grants are until the operating end date. Agencies must generate an APR for each expiring grant. So one APR for each grant that was combined. And a reminder that the APRs are required to be submitted to HUD within 90 days of the end of the operating year. So be sure to keep track of when the operating date is for each of the consolidated grants. Uh, 211 cannot move forward with the consolidating process in HMIS until the APRs for all projects that were involved with the consolidation have been submitted. Uh, so please review the APR carefully as well uh, for any errors uh, because once the reports are moved in HMIS, the APRs cannot be reproduced. The projects in HMIS um, will be associated with the new grant. Um, that's going to be become the home grant, the home project for the new grant. So after the APR for the expiring grant is reviewed and submitted, the HMIS team will move all open records. So any stayers who do not have an exit date prior to the operating end date for the grant 
to the new home project in the system. And that's so that all client data remains uh, intact for length of stay, eligibility, time from move-in, and other important information like that. Uh, agencies must notify the HMIS team when each of the APRs for every con uh, grant contract uh, that was combined is submitted so that the active enrollments are moved over to the home project as soon as possible. I'm just pausing a minute to see if there are any questions. So if you don't have COC funding, um, you don't have to worry about what we just said. Uh, if you do have COC funding, but you didn't consolidate any of your grants last year, you also don't have to worry about what we just said. <laughs> okay, I'll go ahead and mute myself. Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, Adriana? Can you hear me? Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, next Thursday at the Data and Performance Management meeting, we're going to be presenting the Transition Housing Performance Projects a report. Sorry, the report period for those projects is going to be 5 1 18 to 4 30 19. And also, last week we sent a correction spreadsheet to all the pro transitional housing providers. So, the idea is that you review the data and uh, make the corrections in HMS. So uh, the, the report, the final two reports that we're going to be presenting next Thursday are reflecting those corrections. So that's why it is important for you to, to address them. And also, thank you very much for making the corrections. And for those of you who enter tickets, we get excited when we get tickets about corrections. <laughs> um, also, the final reports will be posted on our website. They are going to be in the reports page that Casey just showed you guys. And uh, just a final reminder that the meeting is going to be next Thursday, June 13th at 1.30 p.m. here at the CASA training room. And that, that is it. Are there any questions? All right. So um, I'm not seeing any questions yet. Um, that was all we had to cover today so i'm just gonna um hang out for a minute and see if anybody has any questions about anything we covered during the meeting or if you have any hmis questions that you'd like to talk about now we can do that um so i'll just hold on for a minute um we got a question what is the deadline to review that data i believe it was actually yesterday. It right, was mon Monday at the end of the day, because we, we did run the reports again yesterday. So we gave you guys more or less like a week to make corrections. And so in that way, you would have time and we rerun the report. So the reports were already um, rerun, so yeah. Yeah, so the... So now we are, we've already pulled the data and we're working on completing the analysis for the final report that we'll share next week. Um, quick question on income <laughs> source. Um, we had client that was receiving KinGap as income and we reco um, recorded as other. Is there a better place to record that? I actually haven't heard of that income before. Um, do you have on more information, Rose, on, on what that is and how it functions? Or if you don't know now, um, you could also put in a ticket and we can look at it, but I, I haven't heard of that income source before. Um, so I would say as of now, yes, other would be the right place to record that. Oh, kinship income for caring for family members' children. Um, I, I believe other would be the correct place 
because uh, I know there's like alimony, but that wouldn't really, that's not the same thing. So um, yeah, I would, I would record that as other. Um, sorry, Jessica. <laughs> um, we can look and see who, who received that email from your agency. Um, but yeah, he received an email. Any other questions? Okay, so if you haven't already, please enter your agency's name in the chat so we know who participated. Um, the next meeting will be um, at the beginning of July. Um, we'll include the exact date in the meeting minutes and we will send out this um, recording as well as those meeting minutes this week. And um, thanks everybody for attending and we will see you next month.